love is a political force. It is the greatest political idea. Love your neighbor as yourself is the essence of the Ten Commandments. This is exactly what Hinduism had violated. Don't love your neighbor as yourself. Despise your neighbor as an untouchable. Vishal Mangawadi began his public career as an activist and an advocate for the poor of India in the 1970s. He's been described by Christianity Today as India's foremost Christian intellectual. Vishal has authored over 20 books and has lectured in 40 countries. His most recent book is This Book Changed Everything, The Bible's Amazing Impact on Our World. He currently spends a lot of his time in the United States where he's deeply involved in running what he calls a third education revolution. Thank you very much for joining us today. Well, I'm honored. Now, let's start by getting right up above the whole debate about what many people would think is an obscure old book called the Bible that has no relevance and indeed can be harmful. Uh, and you come from India. You're appropriately dressed today to remind us that you come from India. Uh, a lot of people would say, well, the West and Christianity were the same, and they basically made a terrible mess wherever they went. Uh, India is the product of colonialism, that's England's original sin, uh, and you're better off escaping the past. You radically say that modern India, and indeed the world that we live in, has been fundamentally shaped uh, by the Bible and that overwhelmingly it has been a good thing, not a bad thing. Am I right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, just now we're publishing a book called How the Bible Created Modern India. The title might be changed to The Bible and the Making of Modern India. Uh, I have three other books on Indian history uh, before. The first one was uh, a book on William Carey. He is the father of modern India. He was the Bible translator, a linguist who came to India in 1793. The second one was called Missionary Conspiracy, Letters to a Postmodern Hindu. These were actual letters to a Hindu public intellectual Arun Shori. And the third one was published for the 50th anniversary of India's independence. It's called India the Grand Experiment and currently it's being republished out of Cambridge uh, uh, for the 75th anniversary of India's independence. So yes, um, 25 years ago I was alone arguing that the modern India is a creation of the Bible, uh, not colonialism, but now there are at least 30 other uh, scholars who have come behind me. There is a serious shift, even amongst people who don't believe in the word, what the Bible teaches. Yes, in, in fact, secular historians already knew yeah. this, but no one would admit it because of their biases. You would find this here and there, um, but it, it took uh, a while to put it together. It began because in 1987, a 18 year old widow, her husband had just died after their marriage. She was burnt alive, which is widow burning. Sati. 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 And I, began, I found a German follower of Hare Krishna in New Delhi who championed Sati. So we, this was 11 o'clock at night we were talking. And he- A modern European championing the burning of widows. Yes. So, so on actually, a, on, I, on a funeral part, alive. Yes. So I asked him what he thought of Hitler, and he defended Hitler. I'd never heard anyone defending Hitler. So this is a German follower of Hare Krishna, and I realized that he is living with some devout Hindus who actually champion Hitler's idea that the Aryan race is the most evolved race. And they champion traditional uh, uh, practices such as widow burning. So that began my study of how did the British succeed 
in abolishing widow burning. And I realized that William Carey was the first champion. Others had written against widow burning before that, but he, he was he's known as the father of modern missions, uh, but he championed uh, the case against widow burning. Then he trained Raja Ram Mohan Roy, who is called the uh, pioneer of Indian social uh, reform movement, but he was a disciple of William Carey, which most people don't talk about. Uh, and then uh, finally the widow burning was abolished in, in 1829, <clears throat> but it took a lot of research of these uh, abolished people. Abolished by who? By the Brit British parliament, the British but government. But for many years, the British government had not restrained any of that sort of behavior. Your thesis is it was the missionaries. Yes, it, yes. Yes, it was uh, particularly William Carey. They, they impacted on the uh, Parliament, but it, it was that order. Well, William Wilberforce, who was a member of Parliament, yep. every day he prayed for widow burning in his dining table because Carey had a group of researchers who would send names. So here is this widow in this village, here is that widow in that village. So the British Parliament was being impacted because of what the missionary reports that missionaries were sending. And the British government in India had no interest in uh, messing with these social traditions. So if a widow is born, so what? Um, so, so this was a, a, a missionary movement that this is abomination. The God, God has said you shall not kill, which gives inalienable right to life. The widow lives for God. Uh, we all exist for the glory of God her life doesn't end with her husband's life. So th this was a theological battle that she has an in inalienable or fundamental right to life and she exists for God and his glory, not for her husband. So th this is a religious, sacred religious tradition, but in the eyes of God, this is abomination. So th th this is just one illustration of the social evils, untouchability was another social evil uh, which um, these people began to fight. And uh, so when I began researching this, uh, I realized that it is really William Carey, a Bible translator, who is the father of modern India. Though Indians wouldn't acknowledge that, except in Bangladesh and Bengal, mm -hmm. they know that he created Bengali language and uh, in that part of India, the scholarly people would acknowledge him uh, as the man who modernized. Just to interrupt there for a moment, you say the father of modern India, but people would look at India and say, well, he can't have been because India is not a Christian country. It's a very religious country. And is it the biggest population in the world now? It's certainly up there with China. Uh, it's really, a very significant it country. Will be it's going to be a, 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 a global superpower, probably yes. already is. Mm -hmm. But it's not a Christian country. You're saying it's, but you're saying it's 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 fathers, the father of modern India, were Correct. Christian missionaries. Well, India never had the concept of a country, or a nation. Right. So when the East India Company came to India, the Mughals were ruling India. It was a Mughal Empire, <clears throat> and uh, then the Maratha kingdoms emerged, Sikh kingdoms emerged, the French had already t taken over parts of India. Portuguese were actually the first. So India never had a concept of India as a nation. No Indian called himself an Indian. Mm. So the idea of India uh, came from the Bible. It, it is the book of Esther describes India as the last province, easternmost province of uh, the Persian Empire. Uh, so twice India is named. It was through the Latin Bible that uh, Columbus got fascinated with India and was looking for a uh, sea route to India when he stumbled upon uh, South America and North America. Um, uh, there, there was an island in the way called America. <laughs> yes. Oh. So the Native Americans were called Indians because he thought this was India. But when they realized it is not, the Native Americans are still called Indians. But a hundred years ago, Native Australians were called Indians, although Australia was colonized 300 years after or 200 years later. And then Indonesia is Indian Asia. Asia. So 
the European mind of Vasco da Gama, Columbus, etc., it was fascinated with India that when you have reached India, you have reached the end of the world. And, but there was no concept of geography in India. So our modern geography, which is captured in our national anthem, was written in 1911 by Rabindranath Tagore, who won a Nobel Prize in uh, literature. Uh, but his geography of Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Maratha, Dravid, Utkal, Banga comes from the British Parliament's 1899 Act, Stamp Act. That is what defined and that act actually ruled Kashmir out of Indian geography. And that's why our national anthem excludes Kashmir as part of India. Uh, because the geography, the, so India never had the concept of geography, country. This is the Bible's idea that God in Genesis 11 divided one people group into many nations by confusing their language and they began to govern themselves in their own language, in their own territory, so which is what uh, Paul, when he goes to Athens, uh, from Greece, the European idea of imperialism has spread all over the world. So the only political idea that Greece ever exported was imperialism. But when Paul goes there, he talks about the Jewish concept of nation, that out of one man, God created all the nations. And he set their times and their borders. So the modern idea of nation uh, comes from the Bible and it entered the European mind in 1648 through the Peace of Westphalia, which was the climax yeah. of the Reformation, where the Reformation begins to study the Bible. Because at that point, uh, most of Europe is ruled by what is called Holy Roman Empire, which is neither holy nor Roman, it's Spanish Empire. Uh, so imperialism was part of European DNA. Imperialism was a pagan idea, uh, which the, the New Testament talks of as Babylon. So, in fact, Babylon in Isaiah 14 is the Luciferian idea. Lucifer is Babylon. It's because imperialism means war. The idea of nation is peace that uh, Russia should respect Ukraine's national borders as sacred because God has divided us into sovereign nations. So the idea of national sovereignty, territory, geography, these are biblical ideas that India never had. So no Indian scripture or literature ever talked about India. It never talked about nation or country. All of these ideas, William Carey, whom I'm calling the father of modern India, he's the first person uh, as an English missionary, he starts a newspaper which is called the Friend of India. Merchants have come to loot Indians. Yep. Soldiers have come to colonize. Well, they didn't actually come to colonize. They came to protect their trade. Defend the traders. D d defend and the it was traders. the British East India Company, which was really England in India, wasn't it? Right. But they came genuinely to trade, yeah. but only in 1757. Yeah. So not to conquer, but to trade, is that your to point? To trade, yeah. exactly. They came to trade. They got permission from the British uh, Mughal emperor to trade, um, and they established their factories, mm. which became colonies, little colonies. Um, but when the Mughal Nawab of Murshidabad, Bengal, when he invaded the Calcutta, colony of East India Company, uh, then they realized that the Mughal emperor has become, the, uh, the rulers have become robbers. And you can't live and trade in India uh, unless you teach the rulers that they sh their job is to defend traders, their job is to defend citizens, not loot them. That's what started the conflict between East India Company and the Mughal Empire which then grew, became British against the Sikhs and British against the Marathas because all the rulers in India were robbers. And the, the idea that the government exists to defend citizens' rights, 
these fundamental rights are given by the creator as the American Declaration of Independence says that all of us are created equal and are endowed by their creator with inalienable rights of life, liberty and pursuit of happiness. Governments are created to defend these rights, to make sure that nobody is violating someone else's rights. But when the governments themselves begin to loot, like Stalin did, of collectivizing agriculture, um, then you have a problem and you need, it needs reform. So it was really the Protestant Reformation, which begins in 1517, climaxes in 1648, after a pretty horrible period. There were 50 years of war, uh, uh, well, 80 years. First 50 years, what is now Holland, was fighting the Spanish Empire. And then last 30 years, from 1618 to 1648, everybody was fighting everybody. Basically, it was Protestant Catholic conflict. Uh, but Europe was as bad as Middle East has been during the last 20 years. Mm. And that fuels the idea in a lot of people's mind that religion starts wars. Overall, it's, religion yeah, actually it's established wars. peace by bringing but the eventually. idea of nations. Yeah, right. So um, the the it was really the secularists like Winston Churchill. Uh, Churchill was an imperialist. He was a great man, but was an imperialist prime minister. It was American President Franklin Roosevelt who put pressure on Churchill to set all the colonies free. Driven very strongly, it has to be said, by his wife. Let's give the ladies a go. Uh, yes. Mrs. Roosevelt yes. was a fierce arguer yes. with Winston Churchill. Yeah. You know, set those people free. Yes. And then, and then Churchill yes. would often come back and say, you treat your Indians better. Yes. But it's much more subtle than that, isn't it? Because you're painting a picture of an India that wasn't a nation to be set free. It had been created largely because it was in the Indians' interests themselves. And that remains It's much so more nuanced than people see. And that remains so today, that only India which respects people's freedom, because Hinduism had divided India. Uh, Muslims were Muslim invaders from Afghanistan. Mm between the year 1000 and 1032, uh, Mahmud Ghazni, just one invader, came 16 times to loot Indian kings. Yeah. Uh, most of their wealth was in the temple, so he was looting the temple. People had no interest in defending those temples because the local kings who were looting the local people and uh, yeah. accumulating wealth in the temples, Every time Mahmud of Ghazni and all other invaders came through Khyber Pass yeah. in Afghanistan, Pakistan border. Now, Khyber Pass is only 52 kilometers or yes. about 33 miles. The Great Wall of China is 2300 miles long. So, Indians could not build a small wall of India, 33 miles, yeah. because India was not a nation. These kings couldn't get together because Hinduism had divided Indian kings through a ritual called horse sacrifice, where a king would uh, try and take over his neighbor's territory. So Indian kings, Hindu kings were always at war against each other. So politically, Hinduism had weakened India. And religiously, Hinduism had divided India into castes. So the upper castes were exploiting, oppressing, uh, treating the lower castes lower than animals. So this divided India was so fragmented and broken that for 700 years, Muslims ruled Delhi. And then the British ruled Delhi for 190 years. Well, they ruled Delhi just for about 100 years or 90 years, but they were in Bengal. But the administration of Bengal, which included Bangladesh, was given to them by the Mughals. So they didn't mm. fight the Mughal to take over Bengal, but uh, because the local emperors, uh, Nawabs, had looted the British colony in Calcutta, uh, and Robert Clive, 
defeated the Nawabs in three different wars, finally the Mughal Empire itself. The Mughal gave, Mughal Emperor gave the administrative authority, it was called Diwani, of Bengal to the British East India Company. That's how a group of traders began to um, govern Bengal. But then with after 1850, during the 1857 Great Rebellion, uh, Delhi itself uh, was fought and won and that ended the Mughal rule. But the point is that for a thousand years, Muslims and British and parts with Portuguese and French, they ruled India because Hinduism had weakened India, divided people against each other through the caste system. Uh, caste is an English word. The Hindi, Hindi Indian word is Varnashram Dharma. Through Varnashram. Oh, well, I'm not going to try and repeat that. No. Untouchability is a simpler word. Yeah. That the Hindu tradition of untouchability, that I despise you as a un- fellow who is not mm-hmm. worthy to be touched. I will pet my dog, but not you. So, and it's not dead today, is it? Well, it's very much so uh, today. Although untouchability itself is illegal, caste is not illegal, but caste is a Portuguese word which the British used to describe the Indian reality. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's not an indigenous concept. Indigenous concept is more complicated. Um, so, um, uh, but yes, the, basically Hinduism had divided India socially and politically and religiously, these untouchables were not allowed to go into Hindu temples. So Hinduism had weakened India, but this concept of friend of India, loving your neighbor as yourself, not treating your neighbor as a despicable, untouchable, low caste. This comes back to this thing we so often talk about as a theme with my conversations. The critical understanding if you're to have any free society rests on the idea that every individual matters. Everyone has dignity, everyone has worth. Even the untouchable, even the woman on the, on the, on the, on the, on the fire well, being uh, sacrificed uh, absolutely. for her husband. Absolutely. So, so, so and, the, and that individual, that notion of the value of the individual is directly related to the idea of nationhood as you're painting it. Correct. And uh, the, uh, what is not understood by average pastor or th- preacher is that love is a political force. It is the greatest political idea. Love your neighbor as yourself is the essence of the Ten Commandments. This is exactly what Hinduism had violated. Don't love your neighbor as yourself. Despise your neighbor as an untouchable. And therefore Hinduism had weakened India, but with this concept of friend of India, So when William Carey, he didn't have a lot of converts, though he laid the foundations of the church in India through Bible translations uh, and training of civil servants and many other things. He's the one who started uh, the world's first agri-horticultural society in 1820 in Calcutta. There was no such society in England. The six months later, the British started uh, agri-horticultural society. But this vision of transforming India's agriculture This had already been articulated by Charles Grant, who became a member of parliament in England. Uh, But before he became, he he was next door to William Wilberforce. He was part of the Clapham sect. So Grant had come to India as a civil servant or a servant of his civil servant first, second time as a civil servant. So he came twice. And then when he returned, uh, meanwhile, on his second trip, two of his daughters died within a week of malaria. His wife became a Christian and then he became a Christian because their death shook them up, raising the question, what is life all about? Is there afterlife? Is there judgment? And he repented. This is, of course, Wesleyan movement is happening in England at that time. So the gospel is very much in the air. And he repents of his sin, becomes a Christian, begins to read the Bible, Uh, with a few English civil servants. And then he realizes that what the East India Company is doing in Bengal is wrong. God could not have given India to us so that we might loot India. He must have given India to us 
because he promised Abraham that through Abraham's seed, he will bless all the nations. So God's objective is to bless the nation and conversion means to identify with God's mission to bless all the nations. So it was Grant who was the prophet of modern India and William Carey, both of them published their books in 1792. Uh, but Grant's book was not actually printed in 92. It was hand copied for members of parliament who were going to discuss in 1793 the East India Company's charter. In the, in the British Parliament. In because, the British Parliament. Because the British Parliament set the rules by which the British East India Company, which was Britain in India, yes. to all intents and purposes, the way it was to behave and, and how, what sort of citizen, if you like, it was to be in India. Correct. So, so it, it was um, a private company. Yeah. Although the stockholders were members of House of Lord and House of Commons, um, they were wealthy people. Uh, but uh, because it had the monopoly, which meant that it had the British government will defend it if yep. the French attacked it. So it, it was a monopoly which the government had given them the right that, yes, you can trade in India. Uh, therefore, they had to abide by the terms mm. set by the parliament every 20 years. And they hadn't been behaving very well. Yes, but, but none of them and none of their uh, stockholders and bosses were saying that they are misbehaving. Yeah. It was the evangelical conscience, particularly symbolized by the Clapham sect. Clapham is a suburb of London. Yeah. And we usually think of them as the people who fought slavery. But William Wilberforce, apparently on his deathbed, said that he thought perhaps what they'd done for India was as or more important. Well, he, he had a number of associates. So uh, Zachary McCauley was his right hand man for slave trade. Yeah. And uh, Grant was his right hand man for India. So all the information that uh, Wilberforce was getting as a parliamentarian about India was primarily coming through Charles Grant, who became a member of parliament later and the director of East India Company. And as the director, he really became the direction of the East India Company, that the company must not loot, but must bless. But that required educating the civil servants. Yeah. These were young boys, 20, 22 mm -hmm. years old, who were coming from England, and they were basically riffraff of English society. Those who did not have anything to lose yeah. by leaving England and a lot to gain if they can survive the heat and the dust and the mosquitoes, a lot to gain if they can rule India. So as they are coming, they need to be trained how to govern. In, they have to learn the languages of the local people. So that's how the East India Company training of civil servants becomes the heart of Bible translation. Bible becomes the book that these civil servants will use how to govern India. How does God want us to govern India? That's so, an extraordinary concept to modern ears. The idea to use the Bible to work out how to govern people for their own good. Because that's, <laughs> that's the picture you're painting. Because what does love your neighbor mean? Mm. Uh, what does it mean that God desires justice and mercy. So the Bible is a political book. It is written in the context of a bunch of slaves in Egypt being liberated by God to become a great nation. What will make you a great nation? The Jews were never numerically great. Even today, there are total number of Jews in the world is 14 million. India is 1.2, 1.3 million, uh, billion. Uh, and China is 1.4 billion at the moment, uh, but India will overtake China. So Israel itself is just 7 million Jews, uh, 7 million live outside. So Israel was never numerically a great nation, but God said to Abraham that you will become a great nation because you will teach your children to walk in God's ways, to do what is just, what is right. Now, this is what Moses is teaching 
in Deuteronomy 4, for example, verses 5 to 8, Moses says, I've given you all of these laws and statutes and ordinances and commandments. If you follow them, you will be a wise nation. You wouldn't need to say that we are the greatest nation because all the neighbors will say that you are a great nation, you are a wise nation. So this is what Samuel begins to teach when the Israelites want a king, that your king will become worse than Pharaoh unless he keeps a copy of God's law and meditates upon it day and night and obeys it. So uh, um, Western universities have deceived themselves and the West into thinking that modern freedom and democracy came from Greece and law came from uh, Romans. The reality is that Greece, the only political system Greece ever exported was imperialism through Alexander, which culminated in the Roman Empire. Um, the, uh, and the, the, the idea of freedom came to the West through the Bible. It was in Scotland after Scottish Reformation that John Knox, Andrew Melville, etc. began to transform the hierarchical Roman system of governance, beginning with the church, but the leadership of the church was really governing the village because the church was the center of every village. And then the whole nation with the conflict of Andrew Melville and James, King James, who championed the doctrine of the divine rights of kings. So, but Knox, who really built modern Scotland as a free society, laid the seeds mm. of it, he never said that what he's doing is building democracy. It was 100 years later that Scottish Enlightenment uh, saw that what Knox and the reformers have done is great, except they called it, Knox would say that I'm building New Jerusalem. I'm building the kingdom of God. But there were so many imperfections 100 years later that we can't really call it New Jerusalem. So uh, people like Hutchins, or Hitchens, he said, let's call it democracy. But everyone knew that what has happened in Scotland, which then, uh, which came from Geneva, uh, Geneva was a Republican city. The, what, the freedom that came to Europe came from the Bible. It was built upon the Bible. The name was changed to a Greek term because the Reformation was already using the word Republic. Uh, the Huguenots were reading the Old Testament that God doesn't want monarchy. He doesn't want kings. He wants Republic because Moses said to the slaves that he is liberated, that I'm not going to be your king. I'm not going to be a pharaoh. My sons are not going to be your king. You choose your own elders who are wise, who are just, who are fair, who are reputable, whom you trust. They will govern you. But you're so terrible that even the, these best wise people are not going to be able to govern you. They need the Holy Spirit. So I will lay my hands on them. They will be anointed. And these men who have already proven themselves when they receive the Holy Spirit, then they will be able to govern you because you are so stubborn, you are so sinful. So this idea of people electing their own senators or congressmen or parliamentarians came from Moses in the wilderness who began this tradition of elders, uh, which through whom God will rule. And this continues throughout the Bible. So in uh, Revelation, for example, in chapter 4, when uh, in chapter 2 and 3, John is looking at the horrible state of the church, seven churches. But then in chapter 4, he, his eyes are lifted to the throne room of God. There is a throne, there is authority in the universe. But God's throne is surrounded by 24 elders. It is the elders who are managing God's kingdom. So, so this concept is what brought about what we call democracy, although around 1910 in the University of New York in Columbia, Columbia University, two philosophers, 
uh, two, two guys, they created the myth that modern democracy came from Greece. This myth was popularized by uh, Will Durant. Uh, across the street of the main entrance of New York University is a Presbyterian church. Du Will Durant was a Roman lapsed Roman Catholic. Every Monday night, he gave a lecture in that church, which was published as Story of Civilization, Story of Philosophy. It was Will Durant who popularized the myth that modern democracy came from Greece, which every university is teaching, uh, be, mostly because the professors are ignorant. But those professors who know the truth, they are deceivers who cannot see that the only political system that Greece ever exported was imperialism. Democracy, freedom came from the Bible, including in India. And Indians knew that. The Nehru Gandhi generation knew that it was the Bible that was the source of our freedom. But their followers followed the myth that had been invented in American um, university. And not in European university, but in American university, the myth was invented. And it was out of Chicago University, the great books um, program that uh, Mortimer and all st started. Through that, this whole idea during the last 120 years, uh, 110 years, spread that modern freedoms came from Greece. This is, yeah, goodness, you are, there's so much information in here. Uh, and we're going to come back to how you, in, a, in, in India, came to see the world through these lens. But before we do, it's worth noting that you're saying that the modern India, a democracy, a bit slow and creaky sometimes, but a society that's managing to lift people out of poverty, uh, there is rule of law. Business people will tell you that a contract in India can be established. You know, in a lot of other countries, that's not true. There's a lot to be said for the progress India's made, but it's still far from Christian. It's still a country where there's hostility to Christians. The, yes. The so it's been massively shaped by the Bible, you say, but it's not actually a Christian country. Well, uh, yes. The, the, that, uh, would that would, be fair? Uh, yes, that would be an accurate statement that the entire system was shaped by yeah. Christians, Christianity, the Fascinating. Bible. Um, and now that Hinduism has become politically dominant power for now, mm. uh, they're trying to give away because they, uh, the militant Hindus understand that constitution is anti-Hindu. So they want a whole new constitution has already been proposed that we should throw out this Christian constitution that the British gave us and we should create a new Hindu constitution because the British, see in 1833, it was Lord Macaulay, the son of Zachary Macaulay, he grew up under the wings of Wilberforce. When Wilberforce was on his deathbed, it was Lord Macaulay who gave the final lecture that abolished slavery. Slave trade had been abolished in 1807 or so. Yes. But not but slavery itself. Slavery itself was it was Lord Macaulay. Now, in 1833, he, when the charter of East India Company came up for renewal, he gave a lecture, which I've quoted in some of my books. The lecture is easily available on the internet, where he argued that the British policy in India must be to set India free by giving them these institutions of freedom. Yeah that have developed here. Yeah. Now, when he, he actually then came to India to write the, our yeah. law, what is called the Indian Penal Code, he was a bachelor. So he lived with his sister, Hannah, uh, who was married to Sir Charles Trevelyan. The Wikipedia is terrible in how it deals with Trevelyan. Uh, in 1838, Trevelyan wrote a book on the education of the people of India in which on the very first page, he argues that the purpose of Christian education in India is to prepare India for freedom. This is 1838 before Mahatma Gandhi's father is born. So these, these great uh, British uh, evangelicals have already argued 
that the God must have given India to us because they have a very providential view of history. Uh, they believe that providence governs. God is working in history. So they are not secular intellectuals who don't believe that God has anything to do with history. So they, but, but they believe that God is out to bless India and we are to prepare Indians to govern themselves. So this is stated in black and white uh, in Trevelyan's book, in, uh, which is guiding the entire educational movement in India uh, from 1838. So this is what, uh, this is how Indian leaders begin to perceive. So in fact, the first low caste Hindu social reformer, Mahatma Jyotiba Phule, now this will upset your audience, but a uh, most respected first low caste Hindu social reformer in India who never becomes a Christian, he says that the British rule in India is kingdom of God. God has brought these people to change India, to civilize India. So he, 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 uh, his favorite word for Christ is Baliraja. So he uses one of the Indian mythology myth of Bali Raja, a, a king who, is, who sacrifices himself uh, as uh, the one who is transforming India. And this transformation requires uh, uh, that the Mughal rule is abolished, Hindu rule is abolished, mm -hmm. Sikh and Maratha rule is abolished, uh, and the British are ruling here to civilize us. Now, he uh, he, he is uh, influenced by Thomas Paine's Age of Reason. Somebody gives him Age of Reason because of which he never becomes a Christian. He becomes more of a rationalist, a liberal theologian, if you would like. Uh, so uh, he is accepted as a Hindu social reformer, although Hindus treated him as, a, as an untouchable. Uh, but uh, this is so. This is the perspective of. Charles Grant, William Carey, uh, Lord Macaulay, Charles Trevelyan, that God is transforming India. Which means that when the British had accepted that yes, India should be set free and we should prepare India for our freedom through the educational institutions. Uh, what happens is, okay, we took India largely from the, the Mughals. If we are setting India free, who do we give India to? Do we resurrect the Mughal Empire, hand over the kingdom to them, or the Mughals, or the Sikhs? India has no political system. The Congress, in Indian National Congress, which with Gandhi and Nehru are associated, this is a creation of an Englishman, Sir Hume. But these are graduates of Christian state secular universities, they are state universities, but they are, they are worldview is Christian. These are Indian sahabs. They are graduates of university who play cricket and drink beer and meet once a year to pass resolutions. Pity they're so good at cricket. Well, you'll disagree with that. But they have no historical right, right to rule India. Gandhi has no yeah. right to rule India because his father was not a ruler. They have no political right to rule India because nobody has elected them. So the British encourage Gandhi that, look, we want to hand over the power to you. But if you want the power to go to these children of the rulers, that's one option that India goes back into despotism of mid, mid middle ages, or you organize a political party where people elect the rulers. So this is why Mahatma Gandhi, when he joins the in Indian National Congress, he transforms it, and this is his greatest contribution, into a mass movement where ordinary people, citizens, will elect their leaders. So there is a political legitimacy to those who come to govern. So what happens through the process of education and through 
this teaching that Gandhi and Nehru and, and Jinnah, who was a Muslim league, they need to become representatives of the people. They cannot get power just because they are university graduates who have studied law. But, so this transformation of creating, uh, 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 making every citizen the sovereign who will elect his own elders to govern them. This was a concept that John Knox has already developed 500, 400 years earlier in, you know, in Scotland. Scotland. Knox was uh, most important intellectual in Europe at that time after Erasmus was Buchanan, George Buchanan. He, he was three years older than Calvin, but he became a Calvinist in 1555 and began to follow Knox. He called it popular sovereignty, which was the New Testament concept of kingship of all believers, that the Lamb of God shed his blood to redeem, purchase slaves of Satan, to make them sons of God. As sons of God, they serve their father uh, as priests and kings. So it, this, the reality was which uh, Knox was already implementing uh, was given a conceptual framework of sovereignty of all believers. Now, this is what Gandhi begins to do in India and the Indian National Congress accepts it, then the Muslim League is forced to accept it. And this transformation of sovereignty of citizens, which the American constitution begins with the phrase, we the people. Yeah. So does the Indian constitution. Indian constitution accepts the American phrase, we the people. It's not we the university graduates, uh, but we the people. So sovereignty of every individual as who used to be the slave of Satan is now a child of God to govern God's kingdom. As you, you, son of ch children of God, you manage your father's state. You make sure that your father's will is being done in his kingdom. This transformation from the New Testament is what creates Indian democracy today. Although our politicians and historians, most of them don't know anything about it, but those who know are too embarrassed to confess that it is the Bible that has created the modern world. In the West, I don't think we know enough to even be embarrassed because hey, this is really fascinating. You stop and think about this. Uh, you're an Indian shedding light on the cultural amnesia of the West because our elites would say, you're defending the indefensible. You're saying that a bunch of white, privileged, educated, male, male Christians, Protestants. Protestants are leading the world into a better place. Whereas in fact, the modern story is that they and their religion are the cause of harm and in the name of critical theory, the essential sin of the world, which is racism. Whites are racist, all whites are racist, white males are particularly racist, and the Bible's harmful. The thing that they derive their power from, it, it needs to be discredited. So it takes an outsider like you, in a sense, to show some real light on the, 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 the place of extraordinary ignorance that we've blundered into. How? Does that make sense? Yes. How Western universities have deceived the West yeah. dawned upon me. You've heard of mm. Labrie. Uh, you've in heard yes. of, well, in uh, Southborough near Harvard University is uh, Labrie led by uh, Dick Kais and his wife, Marty Kais. So Marty, when we began studying William Carey, uh, who helped abolish slavery and became the father of more, the Sati, and who became the father of modern India. So my wife and I wrote our first book on Indian history on William Carey to celebrate the 200th anniversary of his coming to India. So we published it in 1992. So Mardikais was uh, speaking in Harvard University 
and she showed our book to the audience that this is what the, the gospel did in transforming India. A white woman who was doing PhD level research in Harvard, she stood up and challenged Marty, who gave the right to this British uh, male Protestant to go to India and to tell them that widow burning is wrong. Uh -huh. Why shouldn't he respect the local culture? This is what we've got to. This, this is what Harvard University has got to, yeah. that, that cultural relativism, moral relativism means that if Hindus want to burn their widows alive, they should have the right to do this, and the white Christian Protestant male should not interfere with sacred traditions of other cultures. It's astonishing. Yeah, yes. our sacred traditions are bad, they're harmful, because they say things like you shouldn't burn an innocent young lady alive because her husband's died. But those traditions are sacred and should be respected. This well, is the stark reality that that, that people in the West, in my country, need to understand. This is where academia has got to. And this is where Hollywood has got to. So tonight, or tomorrow night, I will be speaking on the question of sovereignty, that if you don't have a sovereign God who is good, then you have the force of Star Wars, where it's uh, energy which is everywhere, which the Jedi take for their ends, and the Sith, the dark side, takes for its end. It's the same energy. Yeah. Um, whether Which one is good, which one is evil, is your point of view. It's relative. It's one energy. So monism abolishes dualism of male and female. It abolishes dualism of good and evil. It makes the concept of rule of law and justice and freedom irrelevant, redundant. Yes. So uh, the West, by rejecting the Bible, rejecting a good God, a sovereign God, who holds the people accountable that he created to live according to his justice and righteousness and law. Uh, the West has destroyed the foundations of its ethics, of its political system, of its economic system. Yes. Um, so, so th there is no reason for Hindus who are controlling the Wall Street or the secular Jews who are controlling Wall Street not to abuse their power. You know, a movie like Wall Street uh, by uh, and Wall Street 2, which was Money Never Sleeps, they show the damage that Harvard Business School has done to Wall Street. And when the crash of 2008 happened, um, Charles Ferguson made a, a documentary which won the Best Academy Award for a documentary called Inside Job. And it actually named and connected the problems of Harvard University that were at the root of the collapse of the crash of Wall Street. What was fictionalized in those films was actually documented by Charles Ferguson that at the, the foundations of the economic system have collapsed because of the foundation of morality that has collapsed. Now this is, we're only beginning to reap the consequences of something that uh, 200 years ago Immanuel Kant the German philosopher had already seen that human reason is incapable of knowing what is right and what is wrong. David Hume, the skeptic, he knew that logic cannot prove God, but he thought logic can know good and evil, which Americans it's believe. It's common sense after all. That's what Americans thought. but. It has always been common sense that I should covet my neighbor's wife and wealth. That I should not covet my neighbor's wife but love my own wife even if she's sick and she's difficult and she's irritable. To love your wife is not common sense. This is a commandment. 
That's a pretty powerful thing to say. Yeah. So, but if if your marriages are falling apart, it is because you think that love is common sense or love is chemistry. Yes, chemistry makes a man love a woman, but the, then the chemistry also turns into hatred that a man hates the woman he married. Love is not chemistry. Love is a fruit of the spirit. The, so you give up the worldview that, the, the, like Paul's letter to Titus, keeps calling for self-control. But self-control requires self to be crucified. That I'm not going to covet my neighbor's wife. Even if I hate my wife, I'm going to ask for God's grace to give me the grace to love and serve my wife. Which builds character, amongst other things. That's character. It's crucifying self. But this is a whole worldview yeah. that uh, God has created man in his image, but man is free like God, and man can choose to hate his wife, divorce his wife, Man can also, by God's grace, choose to love his wife, his children, to build a family. So the, these universities that have given up biblical worldview, they have actually given up uh, the found, foundations of moral life of the West that created the greatest nations in history. Uh, but the universities are destroying that uh, because the, the universities are not teaching and the Bible seminaries uh, do not even understand how modern America or modern England or modern Germany or modern Australia or India were created. So these things are not being taught in the seminaries. That's why I'm investing so much of my time and energy in writing, and re researching and writing. Michelle, this has been absolutely fascinating and I think you're out in Australia so I'll try and catch you again then for session two. But can we just round up very briefly, uh, these you studied philosophy in a country where presumably this what you're talking about was a minority view. It was not what you started out with. It's a pretty radical way of seeing the, the world, but you argue it so powerfully. Well, uh, it was my study of philosophy in the University of Allahabad, where uh, the university education made it impossible to believe the Bible. So I uh, couldn't believe that the Bible is God's word. Doubting the Bible was easy. The difficult question was, what then do you believe? Yeah. I decided that I'm going to believe what the best philosophers and scientists believe. So what do they believe is the truth? So I began to review my course in philosophy, all the notes that I had taken and all the books that I had read. And I began to realize that all along my professors already knew that philosophers know that they don't know the truth. So I came to the same conclusion as the Buddha that all of us are like five blind men trying to make sense of the <laughs> elephant and we cannot know the elephant unless there is a sixth person who is not blind who speaks. Can there be someone who is not blind, who speaks, who reveals the truth? Well, I realized that the concept of blindness exists because sight must exist. If sight never existed, then we wouldn't talk about blindness either. So is there someone? That's what began my study of scriptures, that is there a God, has he spoken? And it took about six months of reading the Bible itself, which led me to the conclusion that the Bible is true, uh, but it was really reading First and Second Kings and Chronicles that brought me to the conviction that the Bible is God's perspective on Jewish history. So even if it is God's interpretation of Jewish history, why should I as an Indian teenager be reading it? By that time I was 20. Why should I be reading it? And I, that question suddenly opened my eyes that God chose Abraham to bless all the nations, to bless India. 
is, if this is God's word that you follow me, I will bless you, but through you I will bless all the nations. If this was God's word, has he kept it? Then I began to see and I saw the university where I was studying was a state university in a Hindu country with that particular city, Allahabad was a Muslim founded city, now it's Hindu. But my university had no mosque, it had no temple, it had a church. Why? That opened up a perspective that everything good in my city had actually come from the Bible, from the botanical garden and the military canton uh, to the high court and the legal system and the language, my mother tongue, uh, Hindi, uh, everything good in my city had come, the, the municipality where people elect their own ru rulers, so the change from feudalism to democracy in, at the city level, everything had come from the Bible. So it was really look, uh, a, a look, careful look at everything good in my city. It was an important railway um, junction, of, uh, uh, et cetera, that began this whole process of looking at how was the modern India created. And I began to realize that our politicians and professors have been deceiving us, either because they are themselves deceived by American and British universities, or uh, because uh, they don't know, they haven't really thought about what they're teaching. Well, I stand in awe uh, of your intellect, your learning, your recall, and your civility. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you for what you're doing for Australia. May your tribe increase. <laughs>